Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this evening uh, for Hugh Reichland's talk on uh, Greece. Now, um, for those of you who travel through Norwood, I think you'll all know the name Hugh Reichland because the main street carries his name. That's where he has his law practice. Uh, Hugh lives in uh, Glen Hazel. But uh, more importantly, I, the best way of really introducing Hugh is by saying that he's a, a very committed and active Jew. And whatever he does is all within the confines of his Jewishness. And um, uh, Hugh was telling me that in 1996, 1997, he was involved with the IUA UCF at the time. He actually became the Gauteng chairman and that's when he started his first overseas tours, where he started taking uh, filming, uh, doing films, and um, following that, he got involved with our good friend, Sally Sachs, who I'm sure almost all of us know. And since then, until, until last year, uh, every year he went with Sally Sachs all, to all different countries throughout the world. And that's where he, um, uh, so got uh, his collection of videos and talks uh, put together. And I'm sure that tonight we're going to find this talk on Greece very interesting. You know, it's, uh, I don't have to tell you that right now Greece is in the headlines. Anybody who reads the newspaper, listens to the news, watches TV, you all know that, um, exactly uh, what Greece is. And uh, I think you're going to give us another aside to the Greece that we're reading about at the moment. But um, it's not for me to, do, to give the talk tonight, it's for you. And uh, we, one thing you and I share in common, I discovered, is that both our families come from Kurland. And we come from Kurland, uh, which was, it was like Natal. It was, uh, accepting Natal was more English than the English. Kurland is more German than the German. Therefore, uh, time is of essence. So it's a great pleasure to call on Hugh to, uh, to carry on with his presentation. Thank you, Hugh. Good evening, everybody. And uh, a very big thank you uh, to all of you for coming tonight. I know that with weather like this, the instinct is to snuggle up in bed and uh, watch something on the television as opposed to coming through the, the weather to a, a venue to watch a presentation. I'm really honored by the lovely turnout and I want to thank Lionel Stein very much for extending the invitation to me and you know he was talking about my being a committed Jew and I think it's true to say that Lionel is a man that I think all of us including myself can learn, can learn a great deal from in terms of his commitment to the Jewish community. So I want to thank Lionel, I want to thank Yeshiva College and also Mr. Lester Miss who is uh, the technical backup tonight. Um, I did actually bring a DVD which doesn't seem to be working for some reason. So we're going to do without it. I'm going to do the slide presentation which does cover some of the, or a lot of the material in the DVD. If we can get it to work at the end, we will. But if not, you haven't missed out. I'll certainly capture the essence for, of it uh, for you when I talk. Uh, I also want to just uh, give recognition to Sender Lees that's with us here this evening. Uh, and and Sender is, is, is saying, why am I referring to him? He's looking at me askance. And that's because Sender was one of the first in Johannesburg to run a series of mine. We did it at the uh, Mizrahi Bayat, I think in the early 1990s. And we ran, I think, a series over five or six weeks. And we had wonderful attendances. And uh, Sender was part of just launching my reputation in the community for the travels that I've done and also want to pay tribute to Soli Sachs and to Will Mizrahi because that he's very much one of the sons of this community of, of whom we're all proud and I want to thank Soli and Will Mizrahi because since 98 I've been traveling with them and I've managed to cover areas that I don't think would have been possible without an infrastructure. A lot of people mistakenly think that I organize tours to go overseas and that I take these trips, I don't. I go as a participant on other people's heritage tours which gives me the freedom first of all to run my practice during the year without all the corp drainers of doing a trip and uh, secondly they organize everything the kosher food the minyanim 
They make contacts with the Jewish communities. And it's actually, I think, virtually impossible as an individual to have access to the leadership of the various communities and to meet the people that we do and get them to open shuls, etc. cetera, uh, if you're not with a group that has had organization preceding you. So I'm greatly indebted to Will Mizrahi for that opportunity. And with him, I've literally traveled uh, about probably 12 to 15 countries, thank God, over the last 20 years. Everything, not everything, but countries from Argentina in South America, Spain, Portugal, Lithuania, Poland, the central, uh, the central, central Europe, Russia, right across to China and Japan in the east. And what it's enabled me to do really is to put together a collage of Jewish history and it's a beautiful thing because it's a humbling thing as we all know the more knowledge that one gains the more you realize how much there is still to learn but it also gives you an opportunity of putting together and sewing together as i said that collage of where the jews moved so we know for example just just from the the, the countries that i've mentioned that the jews started off in the middle east as we well know in iraq bavel around there haran that was where Abraham Avinu was we moved, and I'm giving you a, a, a thumbnail in two minutes, across the Straits of Gibraltar into Portugal and Spain, which became the Jewish hub of the 1400s. And then from there, there was the dispersion of the Jews throughout the world. And one of the things that I'm feeling more and more strongly about, and I've spoken to historians and I've read up on it as well, that is that I think if I had to say to you over here, who of you are Ashkenazim, probably 99% would say, I'm an Ashkenaz, right? Is there anybody that is not Ashkenazi here? Okay, very good. Where are you from? Spain. Okay, but I'm saying you're the last few generations in your family. Turkey. Turkey and Spain. And who else? Egypt. Marvelous, marvelous. Okay, so, the, so 98% of people, and you put your hand up, who are you from? From Morocco. Okay, lovely. So we, you look at this, we've already got representation from three exotic destinations. But, and? From Rodos. Oh, the Disney's. Okay, welcome. You'll see a little bit of Rhodes tonight, Rodos. But, but, but my, grand, my mother's told me that my grandfather told her that there was a tradition in our family that although our family had been in Lithuania for probably five or six hundred years, before that, my grandfather said there was a family tradition that we came from Spain. And that makes a lot of sense. Because when the Jews were dispersed from Spain, they went across Europe and they went to the very small Ashkenazi communities. Ashkenaz means German. They went to the small Ashkenaz communities in France and Germany. Uh, they went to the small communities of France and Germany and then afterwards they moved to Eastern Europe. So many Lithuanians and many people that are Ashkenazim today actually in their family tree would link up back to Spain and Portugal. So what I find is so beautiful is that while many people sitting here tonight might think this is a history that's not our own. This is a history about the Greek Jews. What you will soon see is that even in Greece, and I'm going to come to it in my slide presentation, it was a mixture of Romanian Jews that came there 2,000 years ago. We're going to be looking at the oldest diaspora community on earth, the Greek community. The, the first Jew was found in Greece, and you'll see it in my slide presentation, 2,400 years ago. So Greece has the oldest Jewish diaspora community on earth. You're going to see the oldest synagogue on earth tonight in a place called Corinth. It's not a functioning synagogue, it's just the, the remains of what, it, but, but quite a few of the remains. And that was a place where Paul of Tarsus, Paul from the New Testament, spoke on Shabbat to convert the early Christians to Christianity. You're going to see that picture I took of the building that still stands. And the same happened in Thessaloniki, the biggest Jewish community in Greece. You're going to see, well, it was in Thessaloniki that Paul and early Christianity started in Greece. Because before that, as we know, there was a pagan religion that was throughout Greece and Rome, etc., etc. So the very, very early Christians started in these places, which were started by a Jew, Paul of Tarsus. So you'll see that Greece is made up of Romania Jews going back 2,400 years, 
Spanish Jews, that were those were the exiles that came from Spain and Portugal, and the Ashkenazim that came later. And that's what you find in many of the countries, that we're a mixture of Sephardi refugees and the original Ashkenazim in Eastern and Central Europe, and that's what comprises the communities today. So I think that's beautiful because we must think of ourselves as one unified family, not Sephardim and Ashkenazim being two separate people within a people, but we're one people that started a journey some 3,000 years ago in the Middle East, and since then have spread out all over the world. So without further ado, let's see the story of the Jews of Greece. This is a picture of Romaniot Jews in Greece. Those are the, the earliest Jews that came to, came to Greece. And can anybody identify what these instruments are? Uh, has somebody got a, a hearing aid? Or a, is a squeaky? Bazookis, right? Are they, and I think that we have some members of the Greek community here with us tonight. Elena, welcome. Is that a bazooki? Yes. Okay. You can. Thank you. Now these are people. These are people. This is a Jewish family that had been in Greece for, as I said, probably 2,000 years. But let's have a look at the map of Greece so that oh, you can contextualize what we're going to be speaking about tonight. So we started over here in Athens, this is where we touched down in Athens, and then we went to a place called Corinth, and you're going to see a little bit about Corinth just now, that's where the earliest synagogue is uh, in the, in the, in the uh, diaspora today. We then went with a bus instead of flying, and we drove across the entire country through Meteoro, Mount Olympus, and eventually came to Thessaloniki. So we started driving them in the south and went up to the north. <coughs> the island of Rhodos, somebody mentioned that they came from the island of Rhodos. So this is one of the famous Jewish Greek islands, so to speak, the island of Rhodos, which you're going to deal with a little bit later. And this is the famous canal of Corinth. Now, if we just look over here, what this what happened over here is can you see this? There's, there's two land masses here. So the idea was to break through, to cut through this land mass here, so that boats, instead of going around over here, could come from this area here and through here and go to this area of here, Thessaloniki, which is a great port uh, of, the, uh, of the Baltics here. So this is what happened. They tried to build this massive opening so that ships could pass through, but all they managed to do was make this little canal. Why am I showing this to you? Well, it's got a very interesting history, this canal. The Corinth Canal is a canal that connects the Gulf of Corinth with the Saronic Gulf, Gulf in the Aegean Sea. The Emperor Nero was the first to actually attempt to construct the canal, personally breaking the ground with a pickaxe and removing the first basket load of soil in 67 CE. That's the 67 of the Common Era. But the project was abandoned when he died afterwards, so it started with Nero. It's a very fascinating little nugget of history. Vespasian then sent a Roman workforce consisting of 6,000 Jewish prisoners of war, comprising three groups. Construction was formally inaugurated on the 23rd of April 1882, so waited from the time of Nero until 1882, in the presence of King George I of Greece, and that's when it was finally opened, and little boats can come across, but nothing more. So you think of hundreds of years and thousands of man hours and thousands of people all to just build a little canal. So you know what they say, you know, men, men's, men's trust and God luck, you know, people try and do things, but at the end of the day whether you're going to succeed is not in your hands. Now, near that canal that I was talking about, this is the synagogue that I was talking about, the oldest synagogue on earth. Corinth was one of the largest cities of the ancient world and a center for trade and commerce. It had a strategic position between the Corinth Gulf and the Saronic Gulf and had two harbors. So you will notice that generally where Jews land up is going to be a, a place of, of trade. So the reason, just to go back to when I started originally, the reason that Jews left northern Af North Africa and the Middle East 
was once again because of persecution. Persecution is one of the major factors causing Jews to have to leave. And Jews generally go in search of commercial opportunities, obviously to make a living. And that's why when Spain was at its zenith in the golden age of Spain, roughly from about eight, the 8th century to the 15th century, that's when the Jews moved into Spain because that was the hub of culture and commerce in those centuries. And that's where the Jews went. But the other great drawback for Jews is that Jews go where there is a port. Because ports also are economic hubs and that's where there's economic activity. So the reason, for example, that the Jews came to Thessaloniki was because of the port. The reason that they came to Corinth in those very early days, 2,000 years ago, was that Corinth had two major ports which they tried to link with that canal. And you'll see the same in Rome, just south of Rome, there was a, a place called Osta Antica, which we went to visit when I did the, the, the trip on, in, uh, on Italy, and that too was a trading port, and that's what attracted the Jews to that area. And that's what I mentioned to you earlier, that Paul came to this synagogue on Shabbat to evangelize Jews to move to early Christianity. This is a photograph I took through the fence. Not that I walk over here, but I squeezed my camera through the fence so that it's not obscured by the fence, and took this picture of the synagogue. You can see that Ezra and Nashi probably was on the top here, the lady section, and then that's the synagogue inside. We couldn't see much, we could only see what we saw from the top, I didn't notice the necklace specifically. So there's been a Jewish presence in Greece for over 2,400 years. Alexander the Great, who lived from 355 to 323, so he lived he was in his 40s when he died approximately. He, was, he had a vision of the great priest of the Kohen Gadol that, that ministered in the temple in Jerusalem. And this is in the Gomorrah Yuma. The Gomorrah talks about the fact that Alexander the Great had a vision of a high priest of the Jewish people that prayed for his success in, in battle. And when he was successful in battle, they say that he wanted to pay tribute to the great, to the Kohen Gadol, the, the high priest in Jerusalem, and to the Jewish people. And he never attacked, the Greeks during his time never attacked the Jewish people. As a result of which, Jews in that generation started naming their children Alexander, is there anybody here with the name Alexander? I think Sender, normally people with the name Sender or Alexander. Is that right, Sender? So Alexander, so there you are. So Sender Lisi is sitting here tonight and he carries the name going back to Alexander the Great some 2,000 years later. That was an interesting fact, uh, an interesting fact of history. And there's also Sender Grossos, the rabbi of the Kodal, that also is Alexander. Josephus was, uh, refers to the historian Clericus, who describes a meeting between Aristotle in the 4th century before the Common Era and a Jew who was fluent in the Greek language and thought. Right? This is going back, as I said, 2,400 years. <coughs> the first recorded mention of Judaism in Greece was on the island of Rhodos in the 1st century B BCE. Oh, no, sorry, BC. Hyrcanus, the leader of the Jewish community in Athens, was honored, and that is recorded in Greek antiquity. And archaeologists found ancient synagogues in Athens dating back to the 2nd century. The Jews in Greece through early Christianity, the Byzantine Empire and the Ottoman Greece neared total destruction in World War II. 80%, 8 out of 10 Jewish Greeks died in the Holocaust between 1941 and 1944. <coughs> so this is now the structure of who are the Jews that came into Greece. And I'm just going, get, going through all the, the, the technical stuff before we look at the photographs and I'll take you on the tour of Greece. So the earliest Jews were the Romaniots, and it actually comes from the word Roman, but it has nothing to do with Italy. That was the name given to the early Greek Jews. Over 2,000 years they spoke Yavani. None, nobody speaks it today. And it's written with Hebrew letters, but it's the Greek language. And there are communities in Ionina, Tebes, Chalkis, Corfu, and Corinth, the island of Rhodos and Cyprus. That's where you will find Romanian Jews. And that was the first picture that I showed you at the beginning of the Romanian Jews. They are not Sfardi. They are not Sfardi Jews, the, the Romanians. And they have the Minhakul Romania. So their traditions are not Sfardi. They are not Ashkenaz. They are Romanian. And the traditional Jewish prayers that are recited are in Greek, but written with Hebrew letters. The Ashkenazim came from 1376 into Greece. 
from Germany and Hungary to escape persecution. Remember what I said earlier, one of the great triggers of Jewish trekking is persecution. And later, they came from France. Finally, the third group of Jews to come into Greece with the Spartan, they came from Spain and Portugal, about 30,000 of them. And we know that these, the, the, the expulsion from Spain came in 1492. And when did that happen? On which day? Tisha B'Av, which is what we're going to be commemorating in two weeks' time. One of the great tragedies was the expulsion from Spain. Now, why was that significant? Because they say there were not very accurate censuses, how do you say, censuses in those days. But approximately 40% of Jews in the world lived in Spain or Portugal in the 1400s. So when you talk about the Jews of Spain being expelled or murdered, you're talking about almost half of the Jewish world that was affected by that calamity. How many people were murdered? How many Jews were murdered in the Second World War in the Holocaust? Approximately 6 million out of a world Jewish population of? They say 18 million. So that's about a third. So you can see that the Spanish Inquisition was as devastating in its day to the Sephardi community as the Holocaust was to the Ashkenazi community in world Jewry terms some 70 years ago. And the Jews came and settled, and they, they, went, they also came from Italy into uh, Greece, and they settled mainly in Thessaloniki. Today, interestingly enough, the main community is in Athens, but the big community in the past was Thessaloniki. And I'm going to give you a short update in a few minutes that I got off a Jewish website recently with an update as to exactly what is happening in Greece to the Jewish community today as we talk. This was literally published a few days ago. And the Ottomans welcomed the Jews. They saw that the Jews could be contributive. They would improve the economy. The same way that the Spanish initially embraced the Jews and for centuries made the Jews made an enormous contribution to Spain. So the Ottomans had the same thing when they were in Greece. And they established the city's first printing press and it became a center for commerce and learning. Greece was called, or rather, could we maybe use this opportunity to ask everybody to check that their cell phones are off while we're about it? I don't mind if you reach into your jacket rather now than later. Just to put it on silent or switch it off if possible. So Thessaloniki was called Madre de Israel, the mother of Israel, and the name which was Chudel Espanol, which is Latina and which was well known. Thessaloniki was well known for its very high standard of education. Interestingly enough, in Spain as well, the Jews were highly educated and benefited greatly from a very close relationship with the Muslims as opposed to the Christians. Muslims and Jews in Spain had a much closer relationship and there was a great deal of sharing between the two as opposed to the Christians that were almost backward in, in, in terms of a development, cultural development then with the, the, the Jews and the Muslims. And the, there's a famous, uh, when it says over here that the, the, the early Greek Jews were writing, were writing their language in Hebrew, but it was actually Greek, there's the famous story of Ptolemy, the, the, the second, who invited 70 Torah scholars to Alexandria to translate the Torah into Greek, which we know as the Septuagint, and that was when we say that the beauty, that the, the beauty of Yefes was brought into the tents of shame. <coughs> Just very briefly, we say that Noah had three sons, Shane, Cham, and Yafet. And we say that the Greeks today, or the, 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 many of the Christians in, in Europe, come from Yefet, meaning beauty. That's where you get architecture, that's where you get art and, 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 and those forms of, of, of beauty coming into the world that's through Yefet. Shane is Semitic, that's why the Jews are called Semitic, somebody that's against the Jews is anti-Semitic. So that comes from Shane, the son of Noach. And the Torah talks about Shane and Yafet coming together. As it says over here, the beauty of Yafet was brought into the tents of Shem. So Shem were the people that were studying, and the beauty of Greece and the culture of Jewish civilization came together at a certain point in time. And that was when Ptolemy wanted to translate the Bible into Greece. There was this great connection between the two cultures. And in a few minutes we're going to look at Hellenism which was when the Jews then wanted to adopt more of the Greek culture, and that led to certain issues within the Jewish people. 
There were 80,000 Jews in 1939 in Greece. Today there are only approximately 5,000. And I thought I'd give you an update now at this point about what's happening in Greece today just so that you've got it in mind as we move now into the presentation and start looking across the country of Greece. So this is on the 9th of July, it was published. There are 55 needy Jewish families in Greece and a cash welfare payment is the only thing that gets them through the month. When they came to the Athens Jewish community last week for their, Ju for their July assistance, they were given only a portion of their payment in cash, the rest was in supermarket or food coupons. They literally, the Jewish charities in Greece do not have enough money to give the people that are dependent on their money, so they give uh, about half, it sounds like, in money and the rest has to be in coupons. We just don't have cash and we can't get any more, the banks are closed, said Tali Mahir, the community director who oversees the welfare program. We hope to make the rest up to them later. <coughs> Amongst the particularly hard hit are the poor and elderly members of the Jewish community, including many Holocaust survivors. A number of them don't have bank cards, meaning that they are unable to access their pensions or Holocaust restitution payments. So there is a real drama being played out, particularly for the poor. I'm talking, I've got the Jewish angle here, but I'm sure there are many poor Greeks that are in a very similar situation. For the Greek Jewish community, the financial crisis is just the latest setback in a chain of events that has seen Europe's oldest and one of its most storied communities dwindle just to a few thousand members. I'm giving you a praise. Many younger Jewish Greeks faced with the uh, youth unemployment of 50%, left the country, most of them to work or study in other European countries. You note it's not specifically Israel, but they would leave anywhere in the EU, to go anywhere in the EU. Today, most of the nation's Jews live in Athens, and a large portion of them are elderly. In recent years, the community has sought assistance from the Jewish Agency for Israel and other international Jewish groups, such as the World Jewish Congress and the American Jewish Committee. And that was the reason I started my travels in 1996, was because the IUAUCF wanted young people to go to these countries and to see what work the Jewish Agency is doing in raising money in the diaspora to put into those communities. So the IUA that raises money here today, most of that money is not going to Israel. A lot of people think it's money for Israel. Israel today doesn't need charity to that degree as they did once upon a time. But that money is going to the Jewish Agency to help distressed communities in Europe and all over the world. And that's why we were taken there, and that's what ignited my passion for uh, Jewish communities all over the world. Now, just one other more, perhaps, disturbing uh, comment to come out of this article is that the economic crisis has also brought with it a rise in anti-Semitism. In 2012, the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn became the third largest party in Greece, while surveys from the Anti-Defamation League show that Greece has the highest levels of anti-Semitic feelings in Europe. According to the polls, 85% of Greeks believe that some, some, believe some Jewish stereotypes, such as Jews, have too much influence over the global economy. So it is a problem, and when I was in Greece, I was talking to young Jewish people, and they said that their conscription to the army is by law, you've got, it's not voluntary as it is in many other countries, and they also do find a lot of anti-Semitism in the army as well. What's ironic is we're going to see that one of the greatest Greek Jewish fighters in the, against the Italians was a Jew, Colonel Mordechai Fritzis. So it's, it's just so important, I think, for people to know their history. And there wouldn't be, I don't believe, so much anti-Semitism if people understood the contribution the Jews had made to the military and to all aspects of uh, Greek Jewish life. And then, just to conclude, he says here that parents are afraid when the situation is fragile, so the, the Jewish day school I'm going to show you in Thessaloniki is under pressure. There's also worry about how to keep the other institutions running. And there is no clear plan at the moment, said David Saltiel, who leads the Jewish community in Thessaloniki. Very shortly, we won't have the money to pay salaries and the need, he said. The whole system is down and the community functions within the system. So that's a, an update at the moment. So this is when the, the trip of, uh, of uh, Greece began. We saw this on the road as we were leaving uh, Athens. And of course we saw over here passing one of the restaurants, Tzatziki Patates. What is Tzatziki? It's yogurt and cucumber, etc. I remember my father once making, my late father making something like that. 
And Greek salad, we were told the Greeks laugh when you order a Greek salad. So all salad is Greek here. But it's, it's something apparently that you only find in South Africa that, it, that the feta cheese and the olives and the, and the salad is known as a Greek salad. But in Greece, it's just an ordinary salad with feta and with, with olives. Um, and then there's the feta cheese and the garden salad here, the beautiful olives that one would expect to see in these Mediterranean countries. And then we thought what we saw was a Nando's, but it wasn't. And of course we had to do that, Solly Sachs and myself, uh, doing a Shosha Losa when we were carrying the lunch boxes to one of the shores as we were traveling up the country, the Americans and the Canadians and all the rest of it love it when the South Africans get together to do something cultural. Then we went to see a place called uh, Pella, which has got this pebble mosaic over here going back to the year 399 BCE. And that, for me, befuddles the mind that you are actually looking at a mosaic that was laid 2,400 years ago. And that was the birthplace of Alexander the Great. So when we talk about Alexander the Great, to me, the most amazing thing is that you actually see architecture. You see real bricks and mortar, so to speak, of these historic figures that lived some 2,400 years ago, and you might well have seen the very floor that we see today. What, when I see these things, it's, it's almost, it's, it's exhilarating in a sense, but I'm not trying to add anything positive to this particular image that I'm going to share with you, but they've recently uncovered parts of the Kotel in Jerusalem, parts of the Wailing Wall, where there were rocks that were thrown over by the Romans that conquered in the year 70 on the side, as you approach the, the western wall on the one corner. And when you look at the rocks that were pushed over, you can actually see signs of having been burnt. You can actually see the ash on the rock. So when we sit down on Tisha B'Av, it just makes me think that my eyes have seen the very rocks that were burnt as a result of the destruction of the second base of English. So, and, and this is something which I strive so much to impart to the younger generation. And, and, and you know, that people tend to even see the Holocaust as something that happened in a bygone era. It wasn't. It was an unfortunate. I mean, many of us know family members that were actually in the concentration camps. People we've seen living survivors of the Holocaust. And for me, it's when I see these moments, when, when I see things, when I travel through these countries, all of a sudden what seems like a distant human memory comes alive. And history is part of the present. And why am I so passionate? Because I'm not talking about the past. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to unravel the present. Because I believe that the more we understand of the past, the more we can make sense of what's in our DNA. Because I really sincerely believe that in our DNA, in our minds and in our bodies, is the odyssey of everything that we as Jews and humanity in general carries forward. And the more that I can unpack and unravel where my people and where my family has traveled and what has happened to us, the more I can understand who I am. So I believe that the past is very much part of the present. And the future is dependent on the past and the present going forward. <coughs> this is Delphi, the famous place of Delphi. And what do we always think when we hear Delphi? The Oracle of Delphi, right? So who was the Oracle? What was an Oracle? So the Oracle was a person. They would sit there and they would dispense wisdom and generals would pay and other political leaders would pay the Oracle a great deal of money to foretell the future, to give them advice in politics and in business and all other areas. And I was told that many of these oracles predominantly were women, not men. I'm not going to take that further. <laughs> then we saw the place where the Olympic Games, as we know it, actually started. What, what, what is this over here that we see? It's an amphitheater. Where did amphitheaters start? This is it. This is one of the earliest amphitheaters in the world, and it's a Greek invention. And they used to have the Pythian Games, which later became the Olympic Games. And this was built to the, the sorry, the, uh, the reason that the, the Games were started was as a, to pay homage to Apollo. And the Greeks believed this to be the center of the earth, this particular place where this amphitheater was, bought, uh, was built. Now let us have a look at the influence of Greece and the Greek people and Greek culture in the world in which we live today. Ancient Greece was the cradle of Western civilization as we know it today. It was the birthplace of the whole concept of democracy. 
One man, one vote. Something like that was revolutionary. That people could vote and that you didn't have a ruling class and slaves. Something that was revolutionary that was started in Greece. Western philosophy. The Olympic Games. Western literature and historiography. <coughs> historiography. Political science. The study of politics started in ancient Greece. Major scientific and mathematical principles started in ancient Greece. The study of geography, understanding the world, climates, climate change, etc. Biology, a university education, the, 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 to conceive the idea that you would pass from elementary to tertiary education, post-school education is something that came from the early Greeks. The concept of coinage, having a coin as currency, was started in ancient Greece. The concept of Western drama, tragedy and comedy, which Shakespeare in England and other people took forward in later generations, started in Greece. The amphitheater, first in Greece. Pythagoras, Pythagoras' theorem. Archimedes. Socrates, one of his quotes, I only know that I know nothing. Plato, who said, knowledge is a matter of recollection and not of learning, observation or study. He says it was a matter of recollection. We're not here to study philosophy tonight, I just thought I would throw in some of their phrases. Aristotle, the Ramba, Maimonides, in Moirin Ruchim, the Guide to the Perplex states that the classical Greek philosopher Aristotle reached the highest level of understanding a human being can reach, short of prophecy, and calls him the greatest of philosophers from Maimonides, one of the greatest in Jewish law, one of the greatest rabbis. Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of ancient Egypt, was from a Greek family, married Julius Caesar and later Mark Antony. Achilles, who was the mythological hero of the Trojan War, what do we talk about today? The Achilles heel is part of our weakness, right? When we want to talk about the weakness of, of an issue. Pandora's box, mythology, a jar of evil, the concept came from the early Greeks. The concept of a museum, which is a temple dedicated to the muses who are the patron divinities in Greek mythology and arts, and hence buildings, it's a building set apart for study in the arts. Plato started the first museum in Athens. The whole concept of a museum started here. And Nike, who was Nike? The winged goddess of victory, right? And today we have, of course, the famous ram. Poseidon, it was the Poseidon Adventure movie a number of years ago. So that's the God of the sea. So there we can just see a very short overview, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a conclusive list, but it's just to give you an idea of, if you just think about it, our lives today, how much hooks onto those concepts that we've explored now. So what was Hellenism? Hellenism was a new view of man, and it spoke about a human-centered universe. Now that was in direct contrast to Judaism, which talks about a God-centered universe universe monotheism. So this put the human at the middle. The gods were there to be bribed, fooled or ignored. Clever human beings could live their lives without them. So this was one of the, the concepts that it was a, a, a humiliation of the concept of a god. And if you look at ancient Greek mythology, you will see that the things that go on, the relationships and the adultery and the and, and, and the deceit that goes on between the gods was a way of reducing the concept of an eternal, immortal God that had no body, which is something that the Jews ascribe to, and to bring it down so that what would be the center of the, the, the experience of a human being in the world would be a man-centered universe. We've got to rely on our own intelligence and all our own human qualities to forge the way forward without the concept of a God. Rabbi Beryl Wine says in Echoes of Glory, the literary attitude of denigrating the gods was one of the core attitudes of Hellenism. So here we're talking of course about pagan gods. I mean that was really the origin of what was being ridiculed over here. Describing their gods in purely human terms, many times most unflattering. And it was one of its more insidious aspects as far as traditional Judaism was concerned. Could I ask somebody just to bring me a glass of water, if possible, please? Thank you. Because Hellenistic Jews carried into Jewish life and society this attitude of cynicism, 
sniping criticism, stubborn disbelief in and continuing disrespect for the God of Israel and traditionally Jewish practices and values. They thereby sparked a continuing culture conflict that lasted for centuries. So what Beryl Wine is saying over here is that the effect of those that, that early Hellenism on Jewish life is that there are still Jews to this day that he says are cynical in their attitude to God and they have a sniping criticism and a disbelief in the concept of God. When you see that kind of attitude coming through in Jewish circles, he ascribes it to the damage that was done by Hellenism. Much of the deprecating and condescending attitude of secular Jewry in our time towards Jewish tradition and its practitioners mirrors the attitudes and behavior of the Hellenistic Jews of Grecian times. That's his respectful view as a rabbi and a historian, but it's just interesting to get his angle. I'm not saying it's the last word on the, on the topic, but that's certainly what he believes. For a Jew to be a true Hellenist, he would be required to undergo the painful correction of his circumcision. It's amazing that they had the technology to do that in those times. The body was holy and perfect, never to be tampered with. The Hellenists always worshipped at the temple of the human body. And that was part of the whole idea of the Olympics as well. Because as I understand it, in the early Olympic Games, the men used to run naked, and they used to have oil on their bodies, and people used to stroke these beautiful bodies as they would run through the streets of Athens or wherever else they went, which was the celebration of the human body. Thanks so much, Mark. So now let's give a quick, have a look at uh, an overview of Greece. Greece is one of the first countries to accept the Balfour de Declaration, that's to their credit, when, when Lord Balfour said that there should be a place on earth, Israel, that should be given to the Jewish people, the Greeks were very much in support of that. In 1934 there was large emigration to Palestine, 500 dock workers. Now the, the Greeks, the Greek Jewish community produced a lot of stevedores that, that were involved in the army, remember what I said earlier about robbers and cobblers. So there were many Jews involved in the shipping industry, and those 500 people went into Israel and built up the docks in Haifa, the, the, the Greek Jews. World War II, 12,898 Greeks were in the army and fought side by side with the Greeks. The best known was Colonel Mordechai Francis, a Romanian Jew from Chalkis, and there's a street named to this day after him in Athens, and he is credited with having repelled the Italian army. He was a great, great hero in history. Greece, and it's interesting that he never changed his first name. He was always known as Mordechai Francis, a typically Jewish name. The Archbishop of Askinos Papendrao instructed the Greek Orthodox Church to, alt to, to, to uh, put out false baptismal certificates, and thousands of people in Greece were saved as a result of Archbishop Papendrao. In 1942, 2.5 billion drachmas were paid to the Nazis, and they bought a year until March 1943. It was paid as a bribe by the Jewish community not to be arrested and deported, but it only lasted for a year. March 1943, <coughs> Damaskinos, Archbishop Damaskinos, spoke about the unbreakable bonds between Christian Orthodox and Jews. 46,000 Jews were sent to Auschwitz, and most of the 60 synagogues in Greece were destroyed in 1942. Big part of 43. Corfu, unfortunately, has a, a, a blot on it because it had a mayor, Collas, who was a collaborator with the Nazis, and only 200 of the 1900 people on Corfu managed to escape the Holocaust. The rest of them were sent to their deaths. The beautiful story of the island of Zakynthos. Bishop Christmas gave two names on the list. What happened over here was the Nazis came to the, to the, the Archbishop. Uh, to the bishop rather, and they said to him, tomorrow we want you to have all the Jews of Zakynthos on the shore waiting for the boats, we're going to be taking them away. And the next morning there were only two people that were on the list, and two people were on the shore waiting for the Nazis. The one was the bishop and the other one was the mayor. Mayor Kareri, the surname was, and they hit every Jew on the island, they didn't hand anybody over. And this goes to show that when there's a will, there's a way. And it happened in, what was it, was it Sweden or Denmark? What, I think it was Denmark. It was Denmark, it happened in Bulgaria. There were places, the Italians to their credit, although they were Nazi fascists, and although Mussolini was an ally of the Nazis, it is, it is history, historic fact, 
that the majority of Italian Jews were saved because their neighbors loved them, saw them as Italians first and Jews second, and they looked after them and they survived the war and they had about an 80% survival rate in Italy. So wherever Jews wanted to, wherever the locals wanted to help the Jews, that's where you had the highest survival rates. And that's why there's no coincidence that 90% of the Jews in the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, etc., Estonia, they were murdered because the people that were living with them handed them in or hunted them down. And then in 1947, the Jews of Zakynthos made them out to Palestine or went to Athens. And I actually met a Jew from Zakynthos in Johannesburg. A friend of mine said that she married a good guy, and I spoke to him, and he's actually one of the survivors of Zakynthos. <coughs> this, is, this is a photograph of uh, the island of Zakynthos, and this is a picture of uh, Bishop Christmas. I haven't got a, a photograph of the Mayan Karen, but uh, this is where it all happened, and that's the story. Then to another interesting uh, island, uh, Greek island, this is Rhodos, and uh, I found this quite an interesting picture. This is on the island itself. What does this make you think of which, which town or city in Israel? So it's got the Jerusalem stone, but also a little bit of Tzvat. Tzvat. Isn't that a bit of Tzvat for me? Which is interesting because it was a very, very Jewish uh, place, Rhodos. I think about a third of, of certain parts of it were Jewish. Who's been to Rhodos? I'm sure you have. It's Vivian. Vera. Good. You've been to. Who else? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is this is the shul which I'm sure you went to the Kahal Shalom, which is the Kahal Shalom in the built in 1577, and it's the oldest functioning shul in Greece. So what we've seen is the oldest remain the shul, <coughs> with the, the oldest remains of a synagogue in Europe is that place that we saw in Corinth. And this is the oldest functioning shul in Greece. And this over here on this particular square is where the Jews were lined up to be collected and deported by the Nazis in the Khuderia. And these are the names of, uh, of the Jews of Rodos. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, the Jews of Rodos came initially from the expulsion of the Spain. Many of them went to Turkey. Some remained in Turkey, and others moved again from Turkey into the island of Rhodos. Where did they go from Rhodos? So they went all over the world, but particularly in Africa, the route was to go to the Belgian Congo or to Zimbabwe. Am I right? And then from those two countries, they came south into South Africa. And these are the, the names Aladef, Abuaf, many of them you might know, Benatar, Many names, and we know them in the uh, Hassan, Galanti, then Galanti. I can't see Barrow. Who's your family? Which one? Barrow. Oh, Barrow. So we, we have a lady with us tonight whose family are actually near mentioned over here. Soriano. And this is a photograph of uh, Colonel Mordechai Fritzis, who was known as the Greek Lion of uh, Judea. And he lived from 1893 and he died in 1940 fighting the Italians. Let's listen to the words of what Archbishop Damaskinos Papandreou said. He lived from 1891 and died in 1949, just after the Second World War. He was the Archbishop of Athens and all of Greece from 1941 until his death in 1949. <coughs> Listen to what he said, and maybe should be shared with the present anti-Semites uh, that are popping up in, in, in Greece. The Greek Jews have proven themselves valuable contributors to the economic growth of the country and law-abiding citizens who fully understand their duties as Greeks. They have made sacrifices for the Greek country and were always on the front lines of the struggle of the Greek nation to defend its inalienable historical rights. In our national consciousness, all the children of Mother Greece are an inseparable unity. They are equal members of the national body, irrespective of religion. Our holy religion does not recognize superior or inferior qualities based on race or religion. As it is stated, there is neither Jew nor Greek, and thus condemns any attempt to discriminate or create racial or religious differences. 
Our common fate, both in days of glory and periods of national misfortune, forged inseparable bonds between all Greek citizens without exemption, irrespective of race. Today we are deeply concerned with the fate of 60,000 of our fellow citizens who are Jews. We have lived together in both slavery and freedom, and we have come to appreciate their feelings and their brotherly attitude, their economic activity, and most important, their indefectible patriotism. And we're going to see the patriotism of the Greek Jews later when we talk about the revolt in Auschwitz during the Holocaust. Damaskinos went, went on to publish the letter even though the local Stuttstaffel commander, Jürgen Strupp, threatened to execute him by firing squad. Damaskinos' famous response to him was, according to the traditions of the Greek Orthodox Church, our prelates are hanged, not shot. Please respect our position. <laughs> Amazing guy. We need more people like this in the world. And then I thought that we'd have a little bit of fun trying to see how difficult it is to read Greek. I mean, people say it's, it's like Greek to me. So I'll show you why people say it's like Greek to me. So this word over here, I'm sure there are people in the audience that can, uh, can read this. But this is e perastikos. And you must believe me because I've got a Greek person to help me with that. That's it over there. So that's the I. That would be the P equivalent. The E stays the same. The P is an R. The A is an A. The S is... What is that? What is that one? The sigma. Right, the sigma. T, I, K. And that is the? Amiga. Amiga. Right, at the end. So that means transnational. This is a bus station that we drove past. And I said to somebody, please, I'm going to take pictures. Just come with me onto the bus and just show me how to translate this. So this one is Leoforion. Leoforion. And that means bus. Am I right? Any Greek people here? Am I right? Good. And this is Stathmos Station. Can you see that says Spor? Okay, that's very familiar to South Africans, and I feel very much at home when I found a spot. And I also feel very at home because like, I, I grew up in, in Parktown. I used to walk with the late, to, uh, ra late Chief Rabbi Casper, if you remember him, from, uh, he lived near us in, in Princess Place in Parktown, near where the Park Lake Clinic is. And we used to walk through Hillbrow, but that was also my home sometimes on a Saturday night, and we used to go to a cafe, the, the Paris Cafe Vienne. Am I saying anything that anybody remembers? Yeah. And I remember seeing the Greek and Italian men sitting at their tables, and I went home and I said to my mom, do the Greek men get married? Because they never seem to be with their wives. It was always the Greek and Italian tables, and then we would have our mixed tables. So this, this felt very much at home for me over here, looking at these guys. Then we went to Yonina, a beautiful town. This is now traveling through the country. I told you we went north towards this other <coughs> This is the thick wall of the outer city in probably the Middle Ages, you know, they were all surrounded by thick walls. But now the, the cities are inside and outside. The same as the Lahabd in Yerushalayim. We've got the walls of the old city, but then there's development outside the city and inside. So this is where we walked through one of the old walls. And behind it was the ancient synagogue uh, in Yonino. That's the entrance we're going to show, I'll show you now. Yonino. I'm coming to it now. So this was built in 1877. Shavla Hashem, the gate to God. So this is, this is Allegra Matsas. She's a Greek Jewess and uh, grew up in Yonino. And uh, her father was very instrumental in making the synagogue a national monument that it would be preserved for future generations. She mentioned that uh, the Jews of Yonina came here after the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70 CE. They found two graves in the graveyard going back to the year 1420. Jewish graves. In the 18th century, there were 25,000 Jews in this place, and a third of the population was Jewish. In fact, if you go to Lithuania, many of the Shetla also, a third of the population was Jewish. The same I found in Poland, in many of the, the small towns, a third was Jewish, 
and it used to be like that with a small Spanish, Spanish villages, etc., where the Jews lived when they were in their golden era in those communities. This is the largest synagogue in the Balkans, made in Romania Jews because there were trade routes through Yonina. So that's the name of the place, Yonina. It's like our Stellenbosch, it's a university town. And once again, it's on a trade route, that's why it was inhabited by many Jews. In the 1920s, most of the Jews of Yonina emigrated to the USA, to Broome Street for some reason. They all went to the same street. And uh, in Jerusalem as well, in Machane Yehuda, which we know for the, the market. So that's why you'll find many Greek families from Yonina who settled in around Machane Yehuda. On the 25th of March, 1944, so this was the Greeks together with the Hungarians were, were only rounded up towards the very end of the war. So the Nazis deported them. 95% of the Jews of Yonina died in Auschwitz and, and other death camps. Only 100 returned and there are only 34 Jews left in Yonina. That's why I think it's important for people to go on this heritage tours to see the little bit that's left before it could probably disappear entirely. They still remarkably always have a minyan on the high holidays. That's Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And she was very proud to tell us that it's a university town, as I mentioned earlier, and there are five Jewish professors in the university. That means if you've got 25 people, what did we say here? Of 34 people, you've got five Jewish professors. It's not a bad average uh, in this class. <laughs> uh, that's the, the front of the synagogue. <coughs> My wife Michelle standing in what was the sukkah, the entrance, the inside, the biggest shul in the Balkans. Not the way we have our pews. It's more this like a slightly style, but it's not slightly. And this is a, a plaque that we saw there. These are the names of 1,832 of 2,000 Jews of Yalina who were captured on the 25th of March 1944 and were exterminated by the Nazis in the concentration camps during World War II. The foundation of this memorial was accomplished due to the efforts made by the late Michael Naum Matsas, that's her father, the, the lady that we saw before, Allegra, who collected the required data and by Leon Ari Shemo. Kabili initiated the project and made it through. And that was put up in 1994. The ceiling, the Ezra Nash, the ladies section upstairs, above the ark, Hashem's name, Shibiti Hashem and Nebitami, God is always present in front of me, the Ten Commandments. And this is just to show you over here that the people that were renovating and upgrading over here didn't have somebody that was lettered in Hebrew because they were just sort of painting over what they found. Because we saw over here, see it says here, Dai Lifnei Miatao Maid, know in front of whom you stand, Lifnei Melech Malchai Hamlachim, in front of the God, the King of Kings, Akadosh, it should be Baruchu. But that bet became a Chav because they just simply painting over without having knowledge of the Hebrew words. But it's beautiful that at least the place is looking <coughs> to their credit and that they are making an effort to uh, keep it in good condition. The Aram Kodesh. And then we were amazed to find inside Torahs that came from the Spanish Inquisition. That were brought there in 1490, from 1492, just after 1492 when they came from Spain into Greece. This is from Spain. So they've been sitting in Greece for about 600 years. Beautiful. I mean, in excellent condition. And we were told that that ground is not necessarily from age, it's just the leather that was used to make these particular torahs. The parochi, the covering of the heart. Some of these stones outside the uh, plaques on the wall, the years that they passed away. This interesting mezuzah here, which is on this like door lever, a siddur in Greece, in Greek, we've got the Greek here and the Hebrew here.
cover page, the front page of the Siddur. And this is a tiny pair of filling which we found in the shul. Look how small that box is, a half the size of the front of the finger. Just to give you an idea. And then you can get kosher filling like that. And they say that a lot of uh, Lithuanian Jews have those small filling. Did anybody get a pair of the small filling from your Zayda or somebody who has a hand as, as an inheritance? You did get one. They were very, very small. And I asked why, and one of the reasons I gave, but if there's anybody that has a different answer, please tell me, was that the Jews were very poor in, in Eastern Europe and leather cost money. So they made very small filling because of the cost. Look at this beautiful key to the door. Look at the size. As small as the twilling of the keys make up for it. And then this is a new development near the shore. Just to give you an idea of what's going on today, sort of a revival in some of the areas of the wealthy people. And then we found a whole lot of desolate mosques. Not a soul. You didn't see any Muslims. And all the mosques that we saw were closed, sealed up, and hadn't seen Muslims for decades. Why? Mm -hmm. So apparently there were, were major population swaps, uh, I think in the early part of the 20th century, where the Turks expelled their Greeks, and the Greeks expelled the Turks. So there are very few Muslims in Greece, and apparently there are not too many Greeks in Turkey, they are old enemies, and that's how they Greece of, of the Muslims. Today, I don't think that there are too many, but we did see people in Burkas, uh, in Thessaloniki, and um, we also saw them in some of the hotels in Athens, uh, coming, sitting in the lobby. It was, quite, it was very disquieting for a number of us. Here, another example of an empty mosque. If there's anybody that can help us to tell us what these are, so this looks like Baklava, and what I was told was that there was a great influence of the Turks on Greece with regard to the foods. So there was a, a, a cross-pollination between Greeks and Turks with the way that they would prepare the food. A different kind of Baklava, you see this in Israel, don't you? And uh, this is still in the Yanilu, uh, and you can see over here how Europe has stepped in and invested a lot of money in uh, protecting certain national monuments. This is the lake outside. Just to give you a feel of where the Jews once lived and the kind of quality of life, you can imagine these were very beautiful places. Then as we were traveling up north through the country, this has got nothing to do with uh, Jewish history, but this is quite a fascinating aspect of, of Greek uh, society and civilization. We went to a place called Meteora, where they have built uh, certain monks have built uh, monasteries on the top of these outcrops of rock. So can you imagine building something on top of here, where you can't just hop and skip across? It's, it's, it's phenomenal that they managed to do it. Look at this. Mount Sinai is the monastery yard, but Mount Sinai you can at least come up slowly from the side over here. It's just unbelievable how they actually constructed these. Look at this. I mean, these are sheer cliffs over here. So what they say is that they would create temporary... Uh, bridges. Not bridges, when you send something across, we don't have to What would this be called? A cable car. Like a cable car, a mini cable car. And that's in fact how they get their food into the monasteries, by sending it across with a cable car. So if you really want peace and quiet, that might be a venue. <laughs> Then, uh, while we were traveling through the country, we stopped at Mount Olympus. So this is now just a, a little picture of, of one of the signs on Mount Olympus. It's a national park. And uh, you can see it's not very high, 2,918... I don't know if that's feet or meters, I would imagine. Meters, I guess. You can see here, there's the, the snow on the top. So Olympus is meters, you're 2,980 meters, Kilimanjaro, 5,895, and Everest, 8,848. So Mount Olympus was great for in the early Greek times, but relative to 
other mountains it was quite small. We then went to Veria, a Jewish district of Bogota, and this is the synagogue here. There are no more Jews. I took this photograph of the beautiful knock on the front door while we were waiting for the gentleman to arrive. No great hurry, I think we waited about 45 minutes for him to come open the door. And then we saw the inside of the shul. There are no Jews anymore in Veria, but there was an ancient history going back where Jews have been there for generations. And this is the synagogue as it's been restored. You can see here Tveria, Tiberius, Hebron. That's Hebron. So these are all towns in, in Israel that they would remember the Jews of, of Veria all those years were thinking about Jerusalem. We all pray towards Jerusalem. We've, we've prayed about Jerusalem for centuries and on every, in every synagogue there's a reminder of where home is. Tiberius, Tiberia, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, the Aram Kodesh, the place of the, of the Ark, a picture of the Temple in Jerusalem, in Eshkachet, Yerushalayim, Tishrach, Imini, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its cunning. And this is as we were walking through the streets of Beria, and I looked up on one of the buildings, and this is what I saw, and when I used my zoom lens, it says over here, Zeichel Churban, 1882. So the owner of this house wrote in Hebrew that we should remember the destruction of the temple. And he wrote that in 1882, and it's still there to this day, although it's you and Ryan. And here's another one, 5619, Yerushalayim, Eshkach. I shouldn't forget Jerusalem. This is my wife and a friend of ours in the Ezra Nashim in the lady section of the shul. Couldn't help take a picture of the Court of Justice in Veria. <coughs> and this is the Alexander the Great International Marathon. This is the 40 kilometer mark coming through Veria. We then went to a place called Vito Choro, and it was a beautiful place because it just gave you a feel of a very quiet uh, Greek village where we saw some typical countryside uh, in the center of Greece. Who's that? Zeus, right? And here is a man that is playing with his worry beats. So they called Kupoloi or Kupoloi. Am I right for the people that know about Greek culture? Kupoloi? And it's for relaxation. It's an amulet against bad luck. It helps people to stop smoking or to limit smoking. And it's also a sign of social power and prestige because if you playing with a silver one or a gold one or an amber one, you can very, you know, you can distinguish the different classes by the cupola that you play with. So this is, I'm not sure where he's at. This looks like plastic. <coughs> he has another fellow with his worry beads. Then we went out into the countryside and we found where the shepherds keep their food and their drink against animals in these uh, little structures that they build over here. And we saw a, a, a shepherd this is just a few years ago, you'd imagine that this happened 600 years ago with his sheep. And there's his sheepdog. And I couldn't resist to ask the bus driver if I could get off and take a picture with him. And that's where he kept his food and his bottle of Fanta. <laughs> now we arrive at uh, Thessaloniki, oh. at the top of the country, to the Zulf. And the Jews came into Thessaloniki from Italy, <coughs> Spain. Portugal, Algiers, Tunis, where there was a recent attack, Egypt, Israel, and Germany. So you can see that there was a pouring in from many, many different places <coughs> in the world. Thessaloniki was one of the, is one of the oldest cities in Europe. In 52 CE, Saul of Tarsus preached in the synagogue on three successive Sabbaths, and many converted to Christianity. 1492, after the expulsion from Spain, 29th thousand Jews came into Thessaloniki. By 1519, Jews were the majority of the population and became a haven of religious tolerance for Jews fleeing persecution. 31 synagogues were founded with the names of their places of origin. It was a city known as Irva M. de Israel, the mother city of Israel or Jerusalem of the Balkans. So it's phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, people we've heard, I remember hearing about the music of Salonika. But I think most people don't understand exactly what Thessaloniki was and what it represented. 
and the huge amount of Jews that were there and the impact that they made on the Jewish world. There were more than 50 Jewish newspapers in Latino, French, and Greek, and 60 Jewish day schools in Thessaloniki. In the early 1900s, Jews were about half the population. The city virtually closed down on Saturdays. Sea travelers humorously, humorous, humorously recall the port was only open four days a week. This is the major port of the Balkans because they were resting days. The Muslims rested on Fridays, the Jews on Saturdays, and the Christians on Sundays. <laughs> and yet they made a living. So it shows you, you can keep your business closed on Shabbos and still make it. 1941, 60,000 Jews just before the Nazis came in. 58 functioning synagogues in Thessaloniki. On the 11th of July, 1942, and, that, and you'll see that through all my talks, around July is a very dangerous time for Jewish people historically. That's why we keep the three weeks now between Shiva Sarbatamas, the 17th of Tamas, and Tisha B'Av, and no exception over here. The Jews were deported on the 11th of July. That's during Tamas and Av. And 9,000 Jews were assembled in a place called Freedom Square, which is today a parking lot. I'm going to show you a picture of that. By the Germans, they were humiliated, they were kept in the sun all day, they weren't given water, they were told to do exercises, they were, it was a, a disastrous day, and then eventually they were taken away. And their wives and children were left on the island to be deported later, which was all part of that, just breaking down people's spirits before they went to the camps. <clears throat> August 1943, there were 19 deportations to Auschwitz, Birkenau, only 4% of Jewish Greeks survived the Holocaust. Interestingly, Nicolas Sarkozy, the former French president from 2007 to 2012, had grandparents, Jewish grandparents from Thessaloniki. The old walls of Thessaloniki, the new part, the harbour that was closed Friday, Shabbos, and Sunday, the entrance to the harbour. This is not taken in Mount Sharim, this is a, a Greek Orthodox priest. And you also find a great bond between Greek men and their mothers, very much a matriarchal society, just like you have in Jewish society and many others, where very often a son would take care of his elderly mother. We felt very at home to see some people from Africa now making a living in Thessaloniki, on the beachfront. Unfortunately, signs of the uh, uh, financial situation in, 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 in Greece with many unfinished buildings. But yet Swarovski seemed to be making a living. And one guy could even drive a Ferrari. So it just shows you there's some people that are terribly impoverished and others that seem to be the money. We then walked towards the one of the synagogues in Thessaloniki, the one of the, it's in fact the main functioning shul, which was built in the vegetable market. Why do you think that was? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there were many Jewish traders that were working in the market, so they wanted a shul right close by, so they could go to Shafri, come back, work, winter. So the main shul is actually built in the market. And this is a flower market, this is a vegetable market. And there we are, right between the vegetables is the entrance to the shul, which is actually in this building over here. That's the synagogue inside here. Yad the Zikaron Synagogue, Jewish community of the Saraniki. Yehuda Alevi, president of the synagogue, as you will find in many places in the world, devoted himself wholeheartedly to the designing and rebuilding of the Yad the Zikaron Synagogue. A Kohen, but a Levi. And that's the inside of the synagogue. And these are the local guys, the local Greek Jewish community sitting over here on the left. So he sat in the middle. Rabbi Shetrit, who came as uh, Shabir, he was sent as an emissary from Israel. His family are actually originally from Morocco. He came for a year, I think he's been there for 11 years and hasn't gone back and making a great contribution, keeping the community together. One of the Greek Jews, probably a Romanian Jew, as are most of these guys over here. Beautiful stained glass windows. Sefer Torah, some of the community guys, <coughs> the photograph with the community.
And you remember we spoke about the synagogues being named after, I think we saw earlier 31 synagogues that were named after the places of origin of the Jews that came into Thessaloniki. So you can see over here, this is Lisbon Chadash, 1536. Thanks very much. Catalon Yashan, from Catalonia, in Spain. Lisbon Yashan. Sicilia, Italian Jews. Polia, Portugal, all the places that the Jews came in from in other parts of the world, they built synagogues for their community. I guess much like, is there anything in Ranana where they've named it after South African? <laughs> <laughs> Italia Yasha, Aragon, Aragon. And this is a picture that was taken in the Second World War. These are the 9,000 Jews that were assembled on Freedom Square by the Germans. Kept there all day, and then all night, and then the following day until they were breaking. Today it's a parking lot, and here Michelle is looking at the memorial that's just built outside of the, the parking lot to remember the Jews that were kept over here as prisoners. 50,000 Jewish Greeks of Thessaloniki deported from their mother city by the Nazi occupying forces in the spring of 1948. No, the report in 43, I thought 48 is too late, 43. And exterminated in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Birkenau. This is the cemetery of Thessaloniki. The other functioning shul in Thessaloniki, Rabbi Shidrik. Over here they have our mitzvahs, but mitzvahs and the occasional wedding. This is the more sort of ceremonial synagogue. That's the governor of the shul, Rabbi Shitrit. Sorry, say to myself. And as we were walking down the streets, we found this uh, priest over here. So one of the ladies in our group uh, from Canada said to him, Are you Greek Orthodox? He said, Yes. She said, Are you a priest? He said, Yes. So she said, I'm Jewish. So he said, Well, not everybody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a friendly guy. No? He smiled after the beginning of the smile. <laughs> And it was also beautiful to see these fruit trees in the, in the streets of Thessaloniki. I think in the Johannesburg CBD you wouldn't see such a sight. <laughs> and then we went to a glut kosher nightclub. Glut kosher. So this is a gentleman playing the bazooki. And then we were waiting for the plates to come smashing down. But they said because of the tough economic conditions they throw carnations onto the floor instead of plates. So they hand out carnations. Uh, it was a very tame nightclub. It was kosher and everything was kosher. But uh, this was also interesting that we went to the Jewish Museum in Thessaloniki and the Greek Jews were very well known in Maccabi for boxing. And these were the guys that were obviously working out the stevedores in the harbour. They were tough, strong guys. So this is a photograph here of one of the top uh, Greek oh. Jewish boxes. <coughs> Some of the sportsmen, these look like boxes. And uh, this is an interesting guy, his name is Abraham Rekanati, lived from 1888 to 1980, the founding member of the Zionist movement in Thessaloniki, president of Mizrahi. He immigrated to Israel in 1933, he was the deputy mayor of Thessaloniki, and became a member of Knesset in Israel. And look at the Zionist organizations in Thessaloniki. There was Kadima, B'nai Tzion, Maccabi, Maccabi Boy Scouts, Theodor Herzl, Mizrahi in 1918, Beitar, the revisionists. There was Witzer, but not Zion and but not Israel. Unbelievable. Just like you would find in any place in the world a thriving Jewish community in the north of Greece. Some of the wealthy homes, of the homes of the wealthy in Thessaloniki, photographs in the museum. And this is the train station where the Jews were loaded onto the cattle trucks to be taken to Auschwitz. Dedicated to the sacred memory of the 50,000 Greek Jews of Thessaloniki, we saw very similar inscriptions. 
we then went through the modern part of the Saloniki, the city center, and then left the Saloniki to come back to Athens. There's a picture of Athens. The yellow cab drivers, or rather the yellow cabs. And can you see this here? That's a statue that's uh, to celebrate the Olympics. And the museum in Athens is built over a site. When they started building the museum, as they dug down, they uncovered a whole lot of ancient architecture. And uh, they just un unearthed it. And then they had to put up these massive columns so that they didn't interfere with it. And they've opened it up now for the public. The Israeli embassy in Athens is the Israeli flag. I didn't get too many chances to get the shutter closed and open to get the Magaik of it, but it's the Israeli flag. Some of the beautiful homes as we were approaching the Jewish day school, we had to get out of the bus and walk through the suburb which was built a long time ago before it became such a wealthy suburb. Uh, but today it's, it's, it's really, really beautiful. And not a lot of Jews live here, but it's, it's the place, uh, it's, the, it's the suburb in which the school is. High security, cameras on every corner, we felt very at home. This is all of us walking through the streets until we came to the school. This is the Jewish day school, the only Jewish day school in Thessaloniki. 150 children, 3 to 12 years old. If the mother is Jewish, then they allow them to come into the school. They go on a trip to Israel when they're 12. The school was built in 1960. And the fees are 8,000 euro per year. So that's a fair work of money for people that can only draw the equivalent of $60 a day at the moment. It's subsidized heavily by the community and many of the donors, even when we were there about three years ago, are bankrupt. And uh, after 12, there's no more Jewish education for the Jews of Greece. They've got to go to non-Jewish high schools. So it's only a primary school. Some pictures of this really beautiful school and we were so touched and so impressed. The teachers are passionate. The place is just buzzing and it's just, it was so elevating to be there. It was really inspirational. So it's amazing. There are young Jewish Greek couples there. These are their children. Sorry, thought he was sitting with his grandchildren for a bit. Basil, you must tell him, tell Sonny how much he featured in the presentation tonight. And then we went downstairs into the school hall and I just kind of wandered into the room behind him and I found that it was the mikveh. Amazing, the school has a mikveh downstairs next to the center and next to the wall. I'm not sure if many more than the rebels have used it, but uh, they've got a mikveh which is wonderful. And then Chabad, as they are all over the world, are just incredible. They, they run these Chabad houses all over and I'm really personally indebted to them because I know that wherever I've traveled with Mizrahi, we've been very dependent on the logistics and the food that they provide. And this is a kosher restaurant in the middle of Athens, the only one uh, run by a Chabad couple with young kids. And the kids go to that primary school that we saw just now. Now what happens with many of these Chabad emissaries is that as soon as the kids are over 12, they've got to send them to Israel. So the parents remain in these countries and they send their kids to Israel to study there. It's, it's, it's a tremendous self-sacrifice. This is the Chabad rabbi and the Rebbeson making our sandwiches. His kids. And they even have food flown in from Israel or Laban, Turkey, Shinsel. I mean Turkey and, and chicken frankfurters. And then we went to the famous Parthenon. We can't go through Greece without looking at the Parthenon. Which is presently being restored. You can see at the back over here. Picture at night. And any, does anybody know why the synagogue is still standing and wasn't destroyed by the Germans? The synagogue of Athens. There are in fact two synagogues. There's one opposite the other. They will come to it in a moment. Anybody know why it's still standing? Why didn't the Nazis bomb the synagogue in Athens? Because it was too close to the Parthenon. And they were worried that if they blew up the shul, the Parthenon would fall down. So the shul owes its survival to the fact that it was close to the Parthenon. 
So the, Greek, the, the Nazis were very sensitive to culture. They knew not to blow up buildings, but the people were disposable. So this is the, the one side of the synagogue, the older synagogue uh, in the sanctuary. You'll notice that it's a cool descent. It's uh, heavily guarded, very uh, with armed security, and people cannot walk in here without being checked first. And this is a security guard of police. Police are here 24 hours a day. And we saw Mr. Alvaraz. This is the man that is the head, or was the head, when we were there of the Jewish community. And I'll tell you his fascinating story. Benjamin Alvaraz is a Romanian Jew. So this is that early community that came in 2,000 years ago. The president of the Athens Jewish community. His family had been in Greece unbroken for 2,300 years. Unbelievable. I met a rabbi in Italy, in Milan, and we also thought he was a young Chabad emissary. It turns out that he was an Italian Jew whose family go back 2,000 years. And he's got the lineage going back to the time when the Maccabees came to Israel, from Israel to Israel. <coughs> so it, it, it's, it's quite uh, humbling when you meet people like this. They, their family was saved by a Christian doctor who was a member of the resistance and he, they managed, he managed, the doctor managed to get them fake IDs in World War II. When he was six year old, he was hidden five kilometers from the center of Athens. He had no schooling, had no friends, and he was not allowed to say his name. And his mother's parents, sorry, this is Mr. Alvarez, his parents were captured and sent to Auschwitz and he never saw them again. The two shuls were not bombed by the Nazis because they were close to the park. And as I mentioned, they had the same form, the shul in Vienna. That it was also too close. It's around the synagogue. It was very too close to the Vienna Opera House. That's why the Nazis didn't know that. Why didn't they know up the shul in Warsaw? Because it was a nice solid building that they used for stables for the Nazi horses. So there's always interesting reasons why maybe one or two shuls survived. 24 hour security, 365 days a year, it's in a closed street. During bad economic times, which is what we're seeing now, anti Semitism rises. That's a fact that we see all over the world. Uh, generally, the Greeks have been pro Palestinian in the political conflicts. And this is the synagogue street over here. This is on the left hand side, is the new point. This is the new shul. The old one that we saw was on the right hand side, and that's where the shul is closed off. The new shul. That was standing with Mr. Alvarez. And let us have a look as we come towards the end of tonight's presentation uh, where the Greek community unfortunately ended for many. Uh, Greek resistance in the Holocaust, this is what I wanted to show you on the DVD. We'll see if it still works, but maybe we'll leave it for another evening. The, on the 7th of October 1944, there was an uprising of the Greek Zonda commandos. Jews instructed to put other Jews in the ovens. And there was an officer from the Greek army that was one of the Zonda commandos. The Zonda commandos was chosen for their strength. Remember we spoke about the, the, the Greek boxers and the sportsmen. They were strong guys. And they were kept in a separate part in Auschwitz with fencing around them that they couldn't communicate with any of the other prisoners in Auschwitz. That was because they were Zonda commandos and they were used to take the bodies out of the gas chambers and then put them into the oven. <coughs> that they shouldn't be able to tell people coming into the camps to cause pandemonium. So they were locked out and people couldn't come in touch with them. Can you imagine a life, day after day, with a minimum of food, doing this kind of job? At 2.30 p.m. on the 7th of October, there was a roll call. Nobody responded to the roll call. They were told all to come and, and, and come forward and to be counted. Joseph Baruch, who was an officer in the Greek army, shouted in Greek, Will we make our attack or not? The inmates, some of them jumped on the German guards with a few weapons that they were able to take into crematorium 3. To this day, nobody knows what happened, but when he called that signal, everybody was supposed to get involved, and instead there seemed to be a hesitation or paralysis or something went wrong. But most of the people didn't get involved as they should have been. Only and too few responded to Joseph Baruch's call. In a short period of time, a military squad complete with dogs and machine guns encircled the building and a battle erupted between these few Jews with a few guns and some dynamite and the, the third Reich coming in to wipe them out. Nevertheless, while they were under attack, crematorium 4 was blown up with dynamite and you'd say, what's the use of blowing up a crematorium? Well, that's all that they had access to. 
They only worked in the crematorium. But the idea was that there should be a rebellion and that there, should, that they, there was an attempt to stop the German machine, death machine, operating, even if it meant blowing up a crematorium. The, some of the Green Jews attempted to escape into the nearby woods, but many of them were killed by machine gun fire. Three SS guards were killed and 14 were wounded, and about 300 Greek Jews who took part in the uprising, of the 300, 200 survived. They shot, sorry, 20 survived, the rest were shot. Those heroes fought against their waters beyond hope and decided to die with dignity for a few minutes of freedom, singing the Greek national anthem and raising a makeshift flag in the air. Their revolt was reminiscent of many other examples of Greek heroism. This was written by a non-Jewish person. That was amazed of the, of the Greek patriotism. That when they were so to speak losing the battle, the Greek Jews took strips of blue and white material, put it together in a Greek flag, and all stood together and sang the Greek national anthem as they were being wiped out by the Nazis. And this is a book by Fotini Tomai that I quoted from. And this is a memorial outside the synagogue in Athens to the Holocaust, to the Jews that died in the Holocaust. And we come to the end of the presentation, and it's always good to remind us of the incredible nature of the Jew as seen through the eyes of a, of a, of a non Jewish Gentile. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, he has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people and his commercial importance is as extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contribution to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine and abstruse learning are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in the world, in all ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian and the Persian rose filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. And this is the reason that I use this particular quote tonight. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise and they are God. That's talking about the ancient Greek Empire. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burnt out and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. It's important that the Iranians and Ahmadinejad and all the other people read some of these words over here to know that if you take on a people that are eternal, they become dream stuff, the Jew is eternal. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. Exhibit, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Who said that? Mark Twain. The Gentile American. And in conclusion, because we're now at the time of the three weeks coming up to Tisha B'Av, I thought I would share this as a final anecdote. There is a legend told about Napoleon Bonaparte on his conquest of Europe. He entered into a small European town and heard sounds of wailing and mourning, which he followed and arrived at a synagogue. He was met by sight of people of all ages sitting on the floor, praying and crying. On inquiring, he was told that the people in the synagogue were mourning the destruction of their temple in Jerusalem. Feeling their tangible loss, Napoleon asked about the nature of the temple and its centrality to the Jews. He said, funny, I didn't see anything on CNN today. I haven't heard anything about this, said Napoleon. When did you lose your temple? When he was told that it stood 2,000 years ago and the Jews were still mourning, he replied with the following prophetic words. A nation that cries and fasts for over 2,000 years for their land and temple will surely be returned to their land and rewarded with their temple. Because we never forget, because we and our children are connected to our past, because we mourn, ironically, we continue to survive. Thank you. Thank uh, you <clears throat> very much for a fascinating uh, presentation.
really, really powerful, very interesting. Um, the history of the Jews in Greece, not only uh, a little bit about the Holocaust, which um, I thought it would be more concentrated on. Um, I, uh, I, you, there's actually uh, something that I just wanted to mention about the Greek Jews when they were deported to Auschwitz because a much lower percentage of them actually managed to get to Auschwitz because a trip to Auschwitz from... Anyone know why? No? Okay. The trip to Auschwitz uh, in the cattle cars took five days. That was five days, no water, no uh, sanitation, no nothing. They were just crammed into these cattle cars and apparently uh, up to 50% of them were dead on arrival. Um, n n next uh, week we are having Dr. Ephraim uh, um, Kramer. He's uh, the chief medical officer of FIFA and uh, Maybe he'll tell us a little bit about the corruption in FIFA. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are donation boxes at the back. I'd appreciate uh, those people that haven't given a donation yet to please uh, uh, give us a donation. Um, and there are also refreshments. And I thank you all for your attendance. And once again, thank you very much, Hugh.